Yeah, so uh, I'm a dating relationship coach for women, focus helping women over 40 demographic, helping them understand men, mm -hmm. uh, particularly divorced men. And I'll be candid with you. The reason why I wanted to speak to you, my son turned me on to you a couple years ago, and I just want to say I love your content. Oh, I love your personality. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a kick. And I'm a boomer, so just to give you an idea of um, my age demographic and I heard you on fresh and fit and just pearly things and you know I I just I wanted to talk about what I heard because I these are people who speak in partial truths and um, and then when you get a chance to speak your point of view they cut you off they have they try to bully you with their narrow point of view and I just wanted to dive into a couple things that you speak of because of the the business I'm in okay yeah sure yeah what do you want to start so, well, let's just start, you know, one thing particular about feminism, I'll talk about what uh, just Pearly things uh, talks about, you know, she says the death of a relationship, well, I'm condensing this, but the death of a relationship is due to feminism. And I was just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I'm sure it's probably been like this for all of human history. Now that I'm like 34, I can say that I've seen some things come and go. I've seen how people behave with certain movements. I'm sure as I get older, I'll, I'll see even more clear patterns. But I think that like things tend to start off as like really good ideas, and then things can get a little bit warped or wacky uh, where it goes a little bit yeah. too far. Um, I think overwhelmingly, I would say that feminism has been good for women and for men and for world economies, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, if, if you're going to like dive into it, I'm sure that there are some things that that we can go into where a few women have been maybe, you know, yes girled a few too many times or are having like unrealistic expectations or standards in relationships or like weaponization of therapeutic language and stuff like uh, now I don't know if I would call this like the fault of feminism necessarily. I mean, but it probably wouldn't have happened under a uh, hardcore oppressive society towards women because they've got more autonomy, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I generally my my general thing just because my background is so politically heavy is anytime yeah. somebody wants to lay the blame at the foot of something very broad, usually there's gonna be a more granular explanation. And usually those conversations aren't too fruitful. So like if somebody comes up to me, they're like, yeah, the reason why um, you know crime rates are so high in certain communities is because of capitalism. It's like, well, that conversation yeah. doesn't very, get us very far. And I feel the same way about people who wanna like blame feminism, you know? So I'm just curious, why do you think she just harps on that narrative so much? Um. Probably a, a few reasons. There's, I, I think there's a combination of some like, um, there's an epistemic bubble that forms in online communities where you start to see certain information and then you start to see more information that matches that information and then you see more and more and more and eventually it becomes very, very, very easy to build up this whole repertoire of anecdotes that reinforce your worldview and then consequentially, you know, reinforce the explanation for that worldview. So I'm sure she probably had some questions and introduced to some things and then she sees more and more and more and there are genuinely a lot of horrible women in the world. There are a lot of horrible men. There's a lot of horrible yeah. people, you know? Um, and when I say a lot, I mean, like, there is, what, seven, eight billion people on the planet? It only takes two or three people to make you feel like there's a trend, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure <laughs> she's probably... point of view. Yeah, she's probably seen, like, enough stories of, like, I'm sure there are... I know there are women out there that have abused their men, um, have uh, taken advantage of the divorce process. Like, I'm sure this has happened. So, yeah, that, that'd be my guess. She's just kind of caught in a little epistemic bubble. Now she's built a little echo chamber to kind of discourage and discredit outside voices. So all she can do is continually reinforce the ideas and thoughts that she has about everything, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, I grew up, a, a, like I said, tail end baby boomer. You know, I was raised to uh, go to college, get a job, meet a gal, get married, buy a house, start a family. I mean, I followed that programming to the T and I got married right before I was 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't know how to do, to be candidly speaking, I didn't know how to be in relationship with another human being. You know, I had so little experience before that. Mm -hmm. So as our relationship progressed, we started to move apart. And granted, she initiated the divorce, which, you know, again, um, Pearl harps on the fact that women initiate 70% of the divorces. But the truth was, is we weren't a good fit for each other because we didn't know how to build a relationship. Mm -hmm. Why do you, I mean, is this really a problem of women in relationship or is it that couples don't know how to build a healthy relationship together? Um, I hate it when people give these types of answers. So I'm gonna give a really unsatisfying answer. I, okay. it's, 
there's no way that the answer is impossible to know, but I feel like trying to yeah. figure out why relationships end, um, truly, and I, I hate the way these companies are like, 80% of them, blah, 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 right? Like, relationships are incredible. Exactly, I agree with you there. <laughs> yeah, even like, I would even go as far as to say, as like, infidelity might not actually be the cause of why a relationship ends, you know? Like, it yes. could be the fact that a man and a wife are together for five to 10 years. For whatever reason, maybe the wife develops depression, she has no libido, and maybe for three or four years they don't have any sexual contact whatsoever and then the man you know it, it engages in infidelity and then the woman divorced him because of that reason right so like did the relationship end because of the infidelity I mean kind of but the infidelity was also caused by something else so was it the woman's fault because she's depressed maybe or maybe her depression was caused by something the man right it's really hard to know exactly why any given relationship ends and I hate it when people tend to get like they'll get really reductive they won't even go to the part where they'll be like you know the infidelity or whatever they'll just say like women end 80% of marriages are 80% of divorces are women ending them. So it must be the woman's fault. And it's like, that's such an unimaginably reductive view and a disempowering one too. Like you really have no control yeah. over your relationship or anything that happens at all. Like it's an insane statement to make in my opinion. No, it's fascinating because I, I will speak as a man who, and I suspect a lot of men in my age demographic in particular, you know, they, they tend to nest in a relationship. They, they will stay in an unhappy relationship um, because being with someone is better than being alone type of thing. So the fact that women initiate it more, and if that, you know, and I totally agree with everything you said, it's because there's something fundamentally wrong about the relationship, and I, to characterize it as wrong or missing. And I think in many cases, couples just don't know how to break, you know, to talk to one another to actually work on healing it, you know, mm -hmm. um, versus you... like my parent. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Versus my parents, you were saying? Well, I was going to say my parents' generation, you know, that was where, you know, when they made the wedding, my parents were married 66 years before my, my mother passed away. Mm -hmm. In fact, just, a, just on a side note, my father just turned 98 two days ago. James, um, congratulations, I think, yeah. I know, it's just amazing the fact that this guy is just, I mean, like, I'm always shocked that he's, uh, that he's still kicking. But um, what I was going to say is that that generation, you kind of stuck it out whether you liked each other or not. And if you stayed with each other long enough and go through enough storms, the last 30 years of their marriage, they were actually really happy with one another, even though they went through like a 10 or 15 year period where they practically hated each other. Because back then, you you were, once you were in, it was for life, mm -hmm. you know. Have you, um, um, have you ever seen the movie The Departed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you, you mentioned something. It's funny because I, I had a lady, I think a lady divorce attorney messaged me, um, and yeah. she brought up why men are, are typically not the ones to initiate divorce. Um, and then another, uh, I think a psych researcher emailed me, and a couple interesting answers I got was, one, that thing that you just said, um, that men will stay in bad relationships, um, which, I, ironically enough, I think might be true. It, it reminds me of in The Department. Do you remember the scene where Matt Damon's character is in bed, and he's laying next to the psychology lady, and he literally yeah. says, he's like, if this isn't going to work, you got to tell me because I'll stay in a fucked up relationship for the rest of my life. I, I, don't, I remember him saying that. <laughs> I remember that, that scene, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it reminds me of that. And I think that's probably true because there's like, I think there's really big costs to women maintaining bad relationships, but maybe not as much for men. Um, and then also, yeah. especially if children are involved, um, a guy can be divorced and like separated and like it's not yeah. that big of a deal. But if a woman needs like financial support, especially like child services or whatever, you have to get that divorce because otherwise they're going to want to know like, well, what's your husband's income? What's he's do he doing? You can't qualify for anything because you're still, you know, a part of a marriage or whatever. So it makes sense that they'd be more incentivized to that divorce, too. And then um, yeah. something that you just said, and I never, ever, ever give ground um, in these debates because these red pillars on this idea. But you're actually 100 percent correct. Um, the last thing I, I argued about it, this guy was talking about you got to endure through bad relationships and like that's how you fix them. And you have endure blah, blah, blah. To some there is an element of truth to that, that like if you're yeah. if you're keen to bail the minute things get bad, uh, no relationship is gonna survive, right? There is gonna be some level of like, yeah, you know, we fight and there are issues that pop up and you, you know, having the mentality of like, we're here, we're married, we're gonna fix this and work on it is probably a better mentality to have than I'm gonna run at the first set of trouble with the obvious caveat that there are gonna be some problems that are probably not worth fixing. If your partner has an, an extreme substance abuse disorder or is physically abusive, you know, et cetera, yeah. Well, it's interesting. I'm going to be interviewing Rabbi Friedman. I don't know if you've seen him on YouTube, but uh, he talks about ancient wisdom in relationships. And, you know, from what I understand, the wedding vows were designed to actually, you know, stick through with each other 
through the storms because it is through the storms if you will and, and like I, and I fully agree with you if there's true abuse or there's something really uh, heavily impacting the relationship then it probably makes sense to move on uh -huh. but if you stick through the storms you actually find that you become closer to your partner I think your generation is so and, and, and even to some extent my generation is so quick to get out but, you know if it isn't easy we have this almost you know expectation that relationships should just be easy and if it's not easy oh, i'll just go find a new relationship to replace it i think in fact red pill people in my opinion are just focused on the hookup they're not really focused on creating a healthy happy relationship with another person yeah and i think at the end of the day i think that's where my issue comes in is that like if i was arguing with a whole bunch of left-leaning people then i might take that position obviously it's going to depend on who i'm arguing with like which side i'm representing harder that like maybe we do have too much a transitory view of certain types of relationships, especially in case of marriage, especially in case of children involved. Um, but then obviously, conversing on the flip side, if I'm talking to a bunch of red pillars, like th you can't just tell somebody to endure, 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 and suffer and deal with a bad relationship, especially when you guys don't give any advice on like how to maintain or work on relationships. Like it's not just about being ultra alpha and masculine and killing intruders when they try to break into your house. Like there's a lot of actual like work, boring, communication, feelings, all this like horrible dumb shit that nobody, no, at least guys generally want to deal with. Like, that are really important in relationship maintenance, you know? Oh, I know. When I hear Andrew Tate talking about, you know, the muggers coming out and you have to protect the woman you're with, I'm like, look, I'm six foot two. I weigh 205 pounds. I couldn't fight my way out of a paper bag, you know, right. and I'm, I'm, and I say this because I was never trained, you know, I mean, you know, it, you know, in other countries, you go to the army, men and women alike, like in Israel, they go and spend time in the army. One of the benefits of that is you actually get trained on self-defense. And, and like you were just talking about this the other day, I think it was with Sarah Moore. Um, you're saying how often are these guys actually in situations where they're going to have to defend their woman? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's such and, a it's such a silly yeah like the, to build your life around that. It kind of reminds me of um, I really like guns. I'm into firearms, but like realistically, the the highest risk of violence to my family is either me killing myself with my firearm, especially after a horrible conversation online, or my son yeah. grabbing a gun and accidentally killing himself. Right? Like the likelihood of me actually utilizing a firearm for a self defense gun use is is, is quite low. Um, and the idea that like I don't know if you've met people that like build their life around this. Like I've got a shotgun that comes out of my bed so that I can grab but if I need it here, I've got like a tactical inside the line holster that I can wear my boxer briefs when I'm going around the house at night. Like I've got like flashlights and blinkers at every corner. I was like, bro, like you're like James Bond, you know, nobody's coming to invade your house. Um, and it's cool. I think again, it's, it's cool to like think about those types of things. Um, but to sure. build your entire world around it is like, these are not all, these aren't even one percent. are like most people will never have like the type of violent confrontation in their life where they have to fight and kill somebody. Like this is an exceedingly rare in the first world is an exceedingly rare circumstance. Well, you know, it's interesting. Can I read you something that was on one of my uh, a comments? And mind you, I'm a dating relationship coach for women over 40. But this person, this a male commented on my page. He said, the vast majority of women today have excessive high body count, well into the tens and even hundreds in some cases. Jesus. These people are not only undesirable as long-term partners, but they also have destroyed the ability to pair bond with anyone. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of relationships are because, uh, you know, and because of women, we talked about that, you and I, and that all the courts favor women mm -hmm. and it incentivizes women to end relationships. Why I'm bringing this up is I hear these narratives and I mean, I feel like a lot of young men that listen to these um, creators, if you will, are really to some degree being brainwashed by this. And it's so far from what I believe to be the truth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like you know, divorces are like divorces are humiliating. Nobody likes to get yeah. divorced. There aren't like, and again, I'm, I don't want to say this never happened because I'm sure there's probably some examples of some psychopathic woman that you know does this shit but in general like women don't these guys act like women brag about divorces like they're talking to other yeah. and like if you would ask the average red pillar they would actually say that that yes women get divorced it's funny and fun for them they ruin the guy's life like you know that's this is what they do and they laugh and joke about their girlfriends like no i mean like getting divorced is it's pretty humiliating like most people don't want to go through that process it's not a fun time um but then a lot of it too is when i talk to some of these people and that's what makes it really difficult is sometimes it's really obvious where you're working with people with very very limited relationship experience um especially yeah. when like I, on some of these shows like people go around and be like what is your longest relationship and i don't know if anybody on any of these red pill guys have like had relationships last more than one year um so let it's alone like, one week <laughs> yeah and it's like 
what are we uh, what are we doing here like where is this advice coming from like where are we even getting these stories or these ideas um and the yeah and then the, the this is why i think that the red pill has a pretty short lifespan i don't think it'll last much longer because just all of the predictions and all of the explanations and and the analyses they make of real life like it doesn't map onto anything like you have to exclusively dive into data and get the worst representations to come out with this idea that women are like these divorce hunting monsters it's just you're not going to find it in the real world no, and you know, I, like I said earlier, I'm a byproduct of divorce. You know, I, I turned 40, my, my now ex-wife and I split, you know, and she didn't find it any easier. It wasn't like she was rolling in the dough between the two of us. It, we, there's a diso master. There's these things you have to go through mm -hmm. um, if you go through the court system. I will tell you though, personally, the divorce was the best thing that happened to me because I was so clueless on how to be in a relationship. And I'll share with you, my first year after my divorce was right when online dating began to be fairly prevalent. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, before there was Match.com, there was Yahoo Personals. Huh. And I had over 100 internet dates in my first year. And or what I should say is meter greets. I mean, I was going uh, one after another after another. And for the, in the beginning, I was blaming women as the problem, like the, uh, the whole problem with the dating process with women. Mm -hmm. And then when I looked in the mirror, I go, who's the common denominator in all this stuff? It was me. And that's where you know, I began doing personal development, self-help, spiritual work to actually recognize that I'm not really good at being in relationship. And my point in bringing this up is that you know, a lot of these content creators, they're not talking about how to actually form a healthy, happy relationship with someone. All they're doing is identifying the problem with no real solution other than stop being a hoe and, you know, and let men lead, you know, and like men are really good leaders in the relationship. And I'm saying that tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I, I agree. It's like, th there's, this is what I say, like, when I go on all these shows, it's not even, like, any relationship advice that's ever given. Like, at best, you're getting advice on how to hook up, and then you're getting, like, basically male power fantasy, right? Like, you need to be the alpha. Like, and I, and I even, I challenge people, and I do this way more now, because I'm so tired of hearing these answers. Yeah. When people say things like that, like, men should lead in a relationship, they need to be leaders. What the fuck do you mean by that? Like, if you, because if, you've, if you're in a real relationship, there, you don't, you never dictate terms to your partner right like yeah. there's never a time where you're like listen up where i got a new job we're moving tomorrow pack your shit let's go like that doesn't happen yeah. right or if it does you're probably you're out of that relationship um so this idea yeah these things like men are leaders in relationship it's like no generally both sides have different responsibilities generally both sides yeah. are making decisions related to what they're taking care of like a man is not dictating to a woman if it's a traditional relationship he's not telling the woman these are the cleaning products you need to buy this is the way in which you need to maintain the household like she's doing that right um and then same thing yeah. you know yeah even if the man even if something comes up with a man's career if there's like i've got a new job opportunity i need to move that's not going to be dictated to the partner that's going to be a really big discussion that both people are going to have um every time exactly. i push people on that question of like what do you when you say men are leading what are they leading and i've done this over and over again we'll spend like two minutes on this and it's always back to like well if i'm going down an alleyway and somebody's going to jump and stab <laughs> us like i've got to fight or like if somebody breaks into the house and i need to take control of the situation it's like okay outside of you know like your rambo combat fantasies like how are men leading in a relationship like it's just yeah it's stupid well you might get a kick out of this i once asked my parents what was the secret to relationship success and my dad said you know my uh your mom understanding i'm the leader of the relationship and my mom you know, I turned to her and said, what's the secret to relationship success? And she goes, having your father believe he was the leader of the relationship. Sure. Uh, reminds me of that movie, My Greek Wedding, you know, where she says, uh, my big fat Greek wedding, excuse mm -hmm. me, where she says, you know, the man's the head of the relationship, but the woman's the neck. And, and the point is they have to work in unison. And these, like I said, these creators uh, that I mentioned before, all they do is focus on this one little narrative and make it out that that's the reason why we're having relationship problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to touch upon something and get your thoughts. You know, I, you know, it turns out that 50, half of divorces cite intimacy as the problem for a relationship, and the other half cite money as the problem. And I know when I got married, my, my, um, my girlfriend at the time, who eventually became my wife, you know, we both had to work to financially support ourselves. And by the time we had children, you know, there was more of a, I don't want to say burden on me, but there was a lot more expectation on me to be a provider, mm -hmm. you know, when the fact that I was a generation that spent, you know, we, 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 we used a lot of credit cards, we overspent, and we were always having financial problems. And these guys don't even talk about this 
this in the conversation, all they focus is, well, the man must be making a quarter million dollars to support everyone mm -hmm. or to support the family. And like, that's such a small percentage of the population that actually makes that kind of living. You know, the fact is, is most couples, both of them have to work to support the, you know, their livelihood, if you will. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I agree. This is another big criticism I have is when I go on these shows, they're giving advice like the advice of like be more masculine only works for like the top 1% of people. Like, is it possible that a whole bunch of relationship issues could theoretically slide if you're you know, a multimillionaire? Potentially, depending on the type of person you're dating. Um, but it's like it's such a niche thing and like the vast majority of the audience isn't going to be able to utilize that because most people like you said won't work um and earn you know a quarter million dollars a year that's an exceptionally rare thing in society and it's funny because like on one end a lot of these red pillars will make fun of women rightfully so who say things like yeah i want a guy that makes six figures and then you ask them like how many guys do you think make six figures and they're like i don't know probably like 40 or 50 percent and you're like what a stupid thing to think but then these red pillars will turn around and be like yeah if you want to like maintain healthy relationships and get a good woman you need to make six figures and it's like bro 96 percent of your audience is never going to do that why would you give that advice after making fun of women for expecting it. Um, so I know it cracks yeah. me up that, you know, and by the way, I think in the United States, less than 90% do make over six figures. Yeah, I so think it's, it might be like five to 10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what it is? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and they're not talking to the reality of the average person. I look at my son, he does really well for himself. He's 27, he probably makes 60 or 70,000 a year. But ideally, if you meet someone else that makes close to the same, two incomes are better than one is a better way to look at it. You know, you can pull your resources together. Um, I, I did have another question I wanted your opinion on. Um, yeah, this it. relates to, I hear it all the time, sexual market value. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, uh, uh, speak to me like I'm, I'm a lay person here. You know, like what does that mean and why do they harp on that so much? So sexual market value has to do with the idea that men and women in the sexual marketplace are broadly valued for different things. And I think the reason why people harp on it so much is because it seems like in society we've pushed back on the concept that that's even real or on the idea that that's even real. So as a reaction to that, they hyper fixate on it, right? So like it's, we can probably broadly speak in some generalities that men tend to be preferred more for their accomplishments or achievements. Women tend to yeah. be preferred more for like aesthetics or looks or youth. Like these things are broad true um, now in terms of how it plays out in real life like people aren't only selecting on that right people tend to date within their income bracket women are not these crazy hypergamous creatures that red pillars have them uh, make them out to be and men tend to date women that are on average I think it's like 2.7 years younger than them it's not the average 40 year old yeah. guy looking for the 18 year old virgin bride that doesn't happen in real life generally so um, yeah but I think that's the yes yeah, yeah but I mean values, <laughs> I know, and, and the fact is there's so much more to a relationship than the sexual aspect of it. In fact, most of a relationship is outside of the bedroom than is actually in the bedroom. So the fact that they over harp on that, and, and I think there's damage to be done with that because especially when you women start hitting their 40s and even 50s, um, you know, if, if you believe that your value is just strictly based on your ability to provide sex, you know, that's such a weak foundation to build a relationship with. Um, I don't know. Do you ever see the movie uh, Sleepless in Seattle? Um, I have not. Okay. <laughs> There's a scene where, and there, uh, Tom Hanks, this is a 30-year-old movie now, uh -huh. um, where uh, a friend of Tom Hanks says, for a 40-year-old woman, it is easier to be killed by a terrorist than find a, a life mate. Sure. Uh, when you hit your 40s. And what's interesting, a lot of people feel like, you know, that's a death sentence when you hit 40. I believe it's the opposite because now with the internet, the access we have to people that we wouldn't otherwise meet in our daily lives actually has increased because most people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s aren't walking around single eligible people in their daily lives. And now we have at least access to people. Uh -huh. The problem is we have access to dysfunctional human beings uh, who have terrible relationship skills and they're equally as frustrated because they want to meet this perfect partner who the, that that doesn't even exist. There's no such thing as a perfect partner. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, there was a couple other things I wanted to get your uh, take on. Um, one of the challenges I think in relationship these, relationships these days centers around the fact that we're meeting total strangers. Like we know nothing about this person, which puts hyper focus on attraction to get the relationship off the ground versus real friendship and connection. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree. I've got a friend, um, and if you want to talk to her later, she could probably give you a good conversation too, not so erudite. Um, sh uh, something that she brings up a lot that I've been parroting a lot is that uh, it used to be that we met people a lot through warm spaces, meaning places yeah. where men and women just naturally cohabitated, and you, by virtue of just being around them, you start to form sexual relationships. Um, when I was growing up, that was exclusively how I met women. Um, like, it's funny because I was like, I'm a 5'8 guy who is incredibly scrawny. Like, I weighed 105 five pounds coming out of college um and I, I you know i had bad acne problems and like i i never even knew that these were bad things like i didn't even know five eight was considered short until i started streaming and like got more into the internet culture it just it never occurred yeah. to me and i never had any problems talking to women picking up women um anything like that i just it just never factored into my mind but i've always been in spaces where i've got a lot of friends that are women um a lot of spaces that i'm sharing with women whether it's school whether it's work and the idea of like needing to get on even like dating apps or whatever actually I guess dating apps probably didn't exist when <laughs> I don't know I guess when I was just coming out of college um, no, yeah, just, just coming out right about them sure yeah about. around 2000, 2007 is when I graduated high school um, yeah, yeah it just like that never really it didn't really matter that much but man yeah getting onto the internet um, trying to hunt women down I should say that I don't mean like predatorily but trying to like hunt yeah. partners down like dating apps is a way different and less organic experience than just being in environments where you're around people of the opposite sex you know it's interesting. Uh, my girlfriend and I, and, and by the way, I'm with a partner who's one year older than me. I didn't go down 20 years. Yeah. Um, and we live together. But we watched the show Love is Blind, for example, on Netflix. And mm -hmm. it's an interesting, I, I'd like your take on this. Um, two people, I don't, are you familiar with the show at all? Not at all, no. Nope. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a show where two people are in these pods. They can't physically see each other. Um, there's a group of 10 or 15 men, 15 women. They interact with each other blindly. And during this interaction, they form, you know, re you know kind of connections with a person. And they reach a point where they have to ask, you know, the guy typically asks one of the women to marry them. Mm hmm in this in this 10 day period and they have uh, by the way they're they're in this incubator where they're together 24 7 if you will um not i mean separate rooms for the men separate rooms for the women mm -hmm. and once they get engaged they actually physically get to see each other they go on a honeymoon together or they go they go not not a honeymoon but they go on a vacation with each other with the other couples and then they have to live together for eight weeks uh, and then they have to decide if they want to still stay married to this person. Why I'm bringing this up is I, I, I'm starting to have this belief that you really don't know a person until you live with them. Like, and you'll <laughs> see a lot of these couples like totally break apart and it's all, you know, hidden cameras and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Supposedly. But it's, you really don't know a person until you actually live with them. So my, okay, why I'm bringing this up is I've noticed that dating is just this long, strung out process of what I call just friends with benefits. People aren't really, they're rarely truly integrating each other into their lives beyond, you know, especially when they live, if there's distance involved or, or you know, distance here in Los Angeles could be 10 miles, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> that could be a long distance relationship. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the idea of accelerating that connection early, like living together the way this show does, to really see who this person is versus kind of getting together once a weekend kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of funny that you bring that up. Um, almost suspicious, but I'm sure you're not. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on one second, one second, one second. Hold on. Okay. Hello? I'm here. Hello? Hi, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Oh, sure. <sighs> Jesus, okay. Somebody's reaching out for a 0% credit program. Okay, sorry, I don't know if it was an important call or not. <laughs> Jesus, okay. Um, uh, you said something suspicious, and believe me, I, I, I haven't, uh, the, only, the last thing I watched of you was the Jonah Hill thing. Yeah, oh, no, no, uh, it's just, it's funny because, like, um, the take that I've given a lot on stream, sometimes it triggers people, some people agree. It's like, we're kind of split 50-50 on it. I personally, it sounds mean, but I don't think relationships are real until you're living with somebody. Until then, yeah, it, yeah nothing nothing matters and nothing counts. Um, on From my life personally, and I could see,
see pros and cons against this. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for everybody, but I usually try to skip to the living together stage as quickly as possible because the idea of like spending six to 12 months dating somebody just to find out that as soon as we move in, it's this is never going to fucking work. Um, that sounds horrible to me. And yeah, I truly feel like um, when you're forced to be around somebody all the time, that's when you yeah. stop only engaging with a representative. That's when you like actually really see who the person is. Um, in which case, sometimes the relationship can be uh, improved, and sometimes you can find out that like, holy shit, we are absolutely never going to, um, we're never going to to be able to work together. So yeah, I, I like the idea of like trying, I, but obviously it's within reason, right? If you met somebody, yeah. you know, in one month and you're 22 years old and now you're gonna get like a three year lease in an apartment with them immediately, that's probably not a good idea. But I think getting to the cohabitating stage is pretty important because you wanna find out if, if you can stand be dealing with each other in person without like, yeah, just being able to choose when you see the other party, yeah. No, it's interesting, uh, and, and I, I, I'm starting to believe that for myself, and just to let you know, like, I, I met someone long distance, she lived in Chicago, I lived in Los Angeles, uh, and once we finally connected with one another, we're like, if this is going to work, we need to be in the same city or maybe in the same home, mm -hmm. and within, within two months, we agreed to move in together, we actually didn't move in together until five months, and we, we spent a ton of time together. But now I really know who this person is. And we have a friend of ours who did the exact same thing. And within the, when the year lease came up, they realized that they weren't a good fit for each other. And now they're separating from one another. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think our current dating process is just really, like I said, this almost long drawn out version of friends with benefits. Um, by the way, um, change of subject. You, I, I mentioned the Jonah Hill because my son brought it up to me and I just briefly watched um, you talk about the, the text message mm -hmm. issue that he had and about boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, my point of bringing this up is, I think in an age of social media, um, I actually, um, I had a previous relationship uh, 10 years ago where we actually came up with something called a social media prenup. <laughs> and we had agreements. And by the way, just so you know, uh, she was she's an author of a book called Chatting or Cheating. Okay. And we were on the Katie Kirk show together okay. talking about our social media prenup. This was 2012, 2013, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually had agreements of what we would post on social media ahead of time. So, you know, and we would check in with each other on a regular basis because one of us had a, I was kind of more flamboyant. I didn't mind sharing things. She was a little bit more private. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's probably, um, I think it's probably a, an okay thing to like iron out what you are comfortable with and what you aren't comfortable with. I think that so, social media, um, I'm sure you've probably done your little Evo psych dives and everything. I think like historically mm -hmm. speaking, I think humans maintain at most like 50 to 100 connections. And that's like all, that's yeah. about as much as we're kind of like our built in hardware allows us to handle. The idea of putting yourself out there for hundreds of thousands of people to evaluate and judge or your partner to evaluate and judge, that's a really inhuman thing that we're probably, we're not like, we don't have have it built into us to be able to deal with that. Uh, so I, I can understand people wanting to reach agreements around like what can be posted on social media and what can't be. I think that's totally fair, yeah. I do think that in some ways, um, I don't go down this road too often because people are so insecure and it's just, I don't want to fight about it. I do think in some ways it's kind of funny because like, I think sometimes, um, I think for men and for women, I think that sometimes what social media does, or prior to social media, I think you can be a little bit delusional and be okay and get away with it. But once social media yeah. comes out, you're it's like you're forced to confront a couple of a little like uncomfortable ways that like sexes relate to each other. So like one example on each side would be um, for men, if your significant other starts posting on Instagram and you see like a million guys hitting on her, right? You might think like, okay, let's have a talk. I'm not really comfortable with this many guys hitting on you, you know? And like the average guy probably doesn't realize that like girls have been offered sex like ubiquitously probably since they turned 11 years old, like by adult yeah. men. That's just the reality of being yeah. a woman. But a lot of guys don't know that, you know? Um, and then same yeah. thing with women. Like women might look at a guy's Instagram feed and be like, why are you looking at 
so many women when you're supposed to be with me and you love me. I don't understand. Like I'm a blonde woman and you, there's like 20 like Asian or Puerto Rican girls in your feet. Like what's going on here? Like for women, they might not realize like how much like a man's eyes might stray or wander, you know? Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder for the social media stuff, if it's not even like people are so against it, they just, they didn't even realize what the reality was before. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's hard to, you know, pick out like, you know, what, what is the actual cause for people's insecurities? But, um, yeah. And then I, I think it's fair. I oh, I'll tell you my own. Yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you my own case. I was uh, in a relationship and when it ended, I found myself just stalking her social media page because there was like prior to social media, when a relationship ended, you know, we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have cell phones back then. You just stopped talking to the person. Mm. Now you can just a click of a button, look inside and say, okay, what's going on in their life? What's she doing? Why isn't she, why isn't she thinking of me and all this kind of stuff and it really i think affects our psychology or our or, or not our well our self-esteem if you will mm -hmm. because we now have access to a person that probably it's just best to move on yeah but we have this temptation i mean this huge temptation to keep following someone for just some little dopamine hit are they even thinking of you um i think social media has done more damage than good for uh human pair bonding to some degree maybe it's hard to say more damage or good it's like it's kind of like asking like did agriculture do more damage or good for human civilization because it hurt us in a lot of different ways but it ob obviously yeah. it gave rise to our entire civilization um it, i i'm i'm not too eager to say whether it's overall bad or good but there's definitely a lot of huge downsides that we're having a really hard time dealing with and I do agree with you yeah. for that. Like that's one of the biggest pieces of advice to give to people when you break up with somebody is you have to block their social media feed because nothing will destroy yeah. your mind faster than like, are they dating somebody? Like we just broke up and now they're already talking to somebody and it's only been like two weeks and they're posting pictures with them. And this guy is like four inches taller than me or he's dating a new girl now and I think she's got bigger boobs than me. And I thought it would take longer and I haven't found it. And it's like, you, you'll you like mind fuck yourself in so many different ways. And like you said, yeah, in the past, like when you break up with somebody, they're not like in your face constantly. Like you have to go out of your way to dig for that information. Whereas today yeah. you can just get thrown in your face over and over again by a million people, yeah. Well, also with dating apps, you know, it's funny, a relationship ends and just out of curiosity, you go on a dating app and you see that person's been locked, you know, online for a month or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that, by the way, that particularly, I think hugely affects relationships when somebody still has a profile that's active while you're actually in a relationship with someone um, that, and again, People could people have been doing this for years, you know, uh, interacting with other people, but now it's almost in your face. And I, I really do believe that this causes emotional distress. And so few people actually know how to even regulate their emotions, mm -hmm. let alone identify what's causing this to happen, other than, like you said earlier, maybe blaming the internet and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so where do you see the evolution of relationships? I'm really curious. I mean, or human pair bonding, you know, younger men meeting women. Where do you see things going in the future? Um. Man, honestly, I, have, I know that's a broad statement, uh, you know, I really have no idea. I think that like there's a couple things that probably um, need to change. Um, I, I think that this is like this is my very, very, very broad societal analysis. I think that there's okay. a lot of things in society that only worked because they were kind of kept on rails. Like it was a very strict societal control. And I think we probably okay. assumed for a long time that, oh, well, these are just biological realities that will never change. For instance, women will always be bad at math. Women don't want to have jobs. Women just want to stay home and have babies. Women don't like casual yeah. sex. Like these are all kind of assumptions that we didn't think that these were like social enforcements. We thought this was just biolog biological realities that are going to emerge time and time and time and time and time again. And as society has kind of like changed a little bit or a lot of it, we start to see that some of these things aren't the case anymore. So now we're in like a dire time, especially for men, I would say, to where I feel like women were the ones that received, socially speaking, I think women are the ones that received like relationship training. They learn agreeableness, they learn how to be kind to others, they learn how to manage households, they learn familial duties, like women always have the training. And men's way to get relationships um, always coincided with their career. Uh, you learn how to yeah. get a job, you work, and then that's really all you need. Because like, if a woman wants to be anything in the world, she needs to find a man. She's not going to work on her own. And as women have kind of gone into the marketplace for jobs, 
now women not only had all that social training for managing relationships, well now they have like the man job training for how to work jobs. And then if you're like a normal man, uh, your dad didn't teach you shit about, a lot of people's dads don't talk to them ever about anything related to sex or relationships other than don't get a girl pregnant. That's like the beginning and end of a lot of people's conversation with their parents about relationships. So men have no relationship training. Um, for societal reasons, the left doesn't really want to talk to men because of stupid reasons. And then yeah. the right that's talking to men are giving dog shit advice relating to like hyper masculinity that's absolutely helping nobody so yeah i think we just kind of i, I think that the the future for relationships i think it's going to depend on what kind of like good communication is delivered to men about how to manage relationships uh, and then we'll i guess we'll see what happens yeah you know, it's interesting. Something I say on my YouTube channel uh, habitually is I say, ladies, you're actually the emotional leader of the relationship. Like you have an opportunity to, for lack of a better word, train men. And I don't mean it, you know, exactly like that. But I know in my previous relationship, I was in a relationship with a therapist. And during that experience, and, and again, maybe it was just through osmosis, if you will, by her um, mirroring good communication skills, I actually became a better communicator in relationship. And I learned this through a woman. Mm -hmm. um, you happen to be an uh, excellent communicator and I suspect um, the foundation of your marriage um, is built on really healthy communication. <laughs> Sometimes. <I think> <laughs> <laughs> well, I've watched the two of you at times, <laughs> by the way. And, and, but, but I will say this, you are, one, is you're very self-aware, and B, you know how to articulate your feelings in particular, um, and not bulldoze your partner, or at least I don't get the sense that you do that. Mm -hmm. um, you and, and that is what I think is sorely missing, to piggyback on what you're saying. Men in particular, A, rarely even know how to identify their feelings, and then B, actually know how to articulate them in a way with their partner so they can actually have more effective communication with one another. Um, I will say this, you know, I think your generation and like my son, who's also a millennial, um, he's a byproduct of divorce. Okay, my son is, right? Mm -hmm. And, and we talked about a lot of this stuff when he was, you know, relatively young at teenager age. Um, and I also introduced him to like Tony Robbins and a lot of self-help that I was getting into. Do you see this happening with, you know, the younger generation? I mean, I think they're bombarded with the idea of particularly therapy. Do you think that's helping them become better communicators? Um. I'm going to be honest. I actually don't like the advice of like, just get a therapist. Everybody should be in therapy. Get a therapist, get a therapist, yeah. get a therapist. I, yeah. One, because there are, unfortunately, I think there are a, a healthy number of absolute dog shit therapists out there. And two, yeah. um, I think that rather than just saying like, go to therapy, go to therapy, go to therapy. There are a lot of like strategies and stuff that you can learn in therapy that you can just like tell people about, you know, like if I know, for instance, there's a guy who every single time he gets into a fight with his girlfriend, you know, he calls her a dumb stupid stupid fucking bitch whore uh, because he yeah. like gets really emotionally dysregulated like I can tell that guy like hey listen uh, try to keep a handle on your mood and if you feel like you are uh, you know getting emotionally dysregulated if you feel like you can't keep your cool or you're gonna call somebody a name like go on a 10 minute walk right like that's like a that's yeah. a piece of advice that could literally save a relationship depending on how that person uh, resolves conflict and they didn't need to go to therapy for that you know if you have the money and the inclination I mean I'd always say like yeah going to therapy is good but I mean it's kind of like if you've got like imagine there are a ton of you know really fat people well, we don't have to imagine there's a ton of overweight people but like you wouldn't just say to an overweight person over and over again like oh go to the doctor get a trainer go to the doctor get a trainer you'd say hey try a different diet go to the gym and work out you know you don't have to have like the therapist for everything but yeah I, to, to be clear again yeah I don't think therapy is bad I just I don't like that people scream it as like the first answer to everything and it's like we can probably spend at least five seconds figuring out what this guy's problem is and give him a little bit more tailored advice than just go find a therapist well, and I'm in agreement, and partially because therapy is such a, again, like I talked about dating being a long drawn out process. Mm -hmm. It's you go for one hour a week, you know, and so you have 52 hours uh, of time and you're not actually practicing in many cases, the tools that a therapist may give you. And again, I would agree with you 100%. There's a lot of, you know, not so good therapists out there. Just on a personal note, I did something called the Hoffman process, which was a 
eight day deep dive, he, working on my negative patterns, my limiting beliefs in life that was all centered to what happened in my childhood. And because I did it in this incubator, kind of like what we talked about living together with someone, when you do actually do work on this really concentrated level, you actually come out of this better prepared because again, therapy I think is a long drawn out process that doesn't really provide enough versus doing it in an incubator. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I would say of, on I'm that just, just to uh, to um, to vibe on that. Just to there's a word, okay. there's another word I'm looking for. Um, I would agree that like if you're doing therapy, the absolute best, 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 best thing in the world you can do is find a close friend to help you work on or reinforce the things that you learn in therapy. Because if therapy to you is like a one hour a week thing, it's like learning a foreign language. It's the difference between like going to class once a week versus doing like a total immersion program. Um, it's going to take you years to learn something that you could learn and master in a week if you've got like friends to help you reinforce the behaviors you know okay i'm gonna ask you a stupid question how did you become so self-aware um I, I, being hyper autistic for long periods of time in my life and realizing that if i was gonna relate to people it wouldn't <laughs> it's not gonna work <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> So you actually, so you actually recognize for, and I, please forgive this terminology, you know, a deficiency within you. And I don't even like saying it that way. There's a better word. It just doesn't come to mind. Uh, but I, you prefer, notice, uh, I, th I prefer Ubermensch or superiority, but yeah. Uh, okay. We can okay. Say yeah. yeah, we can say deficiency. Yeah. That's fine. No, yeah. no, no, I just meant that you saw something. Well, really, if what we're saying is you saw something which wasn't going to be effective in your life. And you said, I have to work on this. In other words, like when I recognized that the common denominator with my dating life was me, that you actually then made a conscious choice to work on yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think okay. it's it's funny and it's interesting um, because of my background, uh, I grew up very, very, very independent. And one okay. of the things, and it's funny because red pillars like give this advice, but they always say the opposite. Um, because I grew up so independent, in my eye, like the only person that's gonna help me is me. Um, and usually what I'm trying to think of is like, what are the obstacles in my life and how can I overcome them? If it's not possible, then I abandon that project and I move on to the next thing. So the idea of like blaming feminism or blaming the Jews or blaming some whatever system, it, it just doesn't get me very far. So yeah, usually, generally the way it goes is if I have some interaction, I'm not happy with how things turned out or I feel like I didn't get what I wanted, then I'll kind of like look back and I'll be like, well, what can I do to improve the situation? Was it my fault? Was it their fault? If it was their fault, why did I choose that person? Like that, I'm always generally try to be like, uh, like myself focused first. Like what are the changes that I can make uh, moving forward? Yeah. And I think that's kind of how I've gotten to where I'm at right now. No, and society seems to hyper focus on pointing the finger at everyone else and forgetting that there's three fingers pointing back at you saying, mm -hmm. hey, maybe I'm the common denominator in all this. Uh, is it okay if I switch gears to something you talked about with Sarah Moore the other day? Go for it, yeah. Um, and I'd like your take on it. Um, uh, well, because I know you like to talk about politics in particular, um, you know, certainly during the Trump era, I will tell you on the dating apps, you know, it was very... Um, prevalent you know like if you voted for him that yeah. someone would say swipe one way and you didn't vote for him swipe another way mm -hmm. um i do, i want your take on this because i do believe if two people have distinct different ideologies is it really possible i mean does it even make sense to enter into a relationship if you're really like if someone dies on the sword for donald trump and someone dies on the sword for bernie sanders are these two people even really going to get along it's, I think it, here's one thing that happened uh, that I, it took me way too long in life to realize. Your political beliefs have okay. nothing to do with who you are as a person. Um, I've okay. met some incredibly kind, caring, empathetic, compassionate conservatives and some piece of shit conservatives. And I'm also the same for progressives yeah. or people on the left. Yeah. So that's one thing I immediately noticed. Um, secondly, I would say that it depends on where your values diverge. I think that people can probably get along with people with a surprising amount of political disagreement, but there's gonna be some things that you probably can't overcome. Like if you're somebody that thinks that we need like a capitalist government and the other person's like, I really think socialism is the way to go. I want more like social health care and all that. And they're like, well, I don't know, I want smaller taxes. Like you can, as long as you get along in every other aspect, you know, that can be a fun thing that you argue about, you know, for pillow talk, I guess. But yeah. if you're somebody who, you know, like half your family is Latino or black and the other person's like a race realist who thinks these people are genetically inferior invaders that are trying to displace another country, probably not going to get along too well there. It's going to be very awkward at Thanksgiving. So like whether or not you're compatible or not is probably going to depend on the conviction and the differentiation of your political beliefs. But I will say very, yeah. very, very few people are as strongly politically opinionated as um, supremacy. 
This on par me. Oh, this on par me. Uh, very, okay. very, very few people will have um, the convictions that they seem to when you actually start to talk to them. There were a lot of girls when I was in California. There were a lot of girls that I met on Tinder who would write like communist yeah. or socialist in their profile, and I'm very, I'm left leaning, but I'm very much not a communist socialist. And I'm like, oh shit, like yes. we're gonna be arguing about this because I enjoy arguing. But like as soon as I have the conversation, we start fighting a little bit. I realize like this person doesn't really care that much about this at all. I'll be like, you're really socialist, and they'll be like, yeah. And I'm like, wow. So like, you think we should like take away private businesses and stuff? And they'll be like, no, I just like don't like that there are so many poor people here in LA. I think that's really sad and like homeless people. And I'm like, okay. And that's like the extent of their political, you know, like deep diving. So yeah, it's, I think it's pretty rare that you're getting like KGB operatives that are matching with like people from, you know, the Nazi party, you know, like I don't think people are usually that dug into their political belief system. What's interesting is that, you know, prior to, you know, 2016, politics was rarely ever discussed in the dating realm. It certainly uh, is now just a kind of, a, feels like it can be in your face. Less now that Trump is no longer in office, at least from my perception of what I see in the dating realm. But certainly for those four years, it was like hyper-focused. Your politics was a reflection of your ideologies. And if we're not on the same page, it doesn't make sense to even explore this. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure that it... I want to disagree with you, but I, I think you're right. I'm trying to think of if I ever had somebody ask me, like, do you support, it would have been like, what, Obama or McCain? I'm trying to think if anybody would have ever been like, you're a Republican, I would never date you, or you're, you support, like, I don't think so. It, I don't think it was anywhere near the ubiquity with which the, like, you know, MAGA swipe left or stuff like that. I don't think, yeah, I don't think that they were quite as divisive among young people back then, at least from my recollection. Well, well, I, I'm going to share something with you. I want your take on this because right, uh, this was right during the election. Um, I actually had a date with a woman. We went to the same college, Loyola Marymount. Um, she lived in Orange County. I live in uh, the beach area in um, Redondo Beach. Anyway, we met up and we're talking about uh, our background and she's Italian and my parents were uh, from Istanbul, Turkey, just mm -hmm. to give you some context. And so we, we talked a little bit about politics or upbringing, that sort of thing. Well, we met up on a second date, and I kid you not, here's what she said to me. She goes, I can't date you because your parents are terrorists. <laughs> Wait, what was her background? Uh, Italian. My parents were from Istanbul, Turkey, which is relatively... I mean, and, but she, I think she was so brainwashed during that period of time because the narrative was so strong that if you're from another country that happens to be close to the Middle East or in the Middle East, that you're a bad person. Um, so oh, true. Degree, I'm sorry. I was trying to think of like this from like a Turkish, like Armenian, Kurdish angle. But no, this was back when yeah. we just hated everybody that was brown and from a yeah from exactly. a military. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I was thinking way too deep on this. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, especially around 9/11 and shit. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, listen. I, I, I well, a couple other things I want to talk to you about real quick. If mm -hmm. It's on a personal level. Yeah. I have a friend of mine. Uh, do you know a guy by the name of or a, a YouTube channel called Trip Advice? Uh, I do not know. Okay, uh, he has a, he has over a million subscribers. He's basically he's kind of like the the nerd coach that teaches young guys confidence. And he just wanted to connect with you. So is it okay, Kay, if I put the two of you together? Yeah, you can always shoot an email between us. Okay. CC or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Second, my son, uh, who actually uh, did debate in college, um, is curious about maybe if you had any advice for him to how to get into the, the debate streaming sphere, how to go about that, if you had any thoughts on that. Um, be strongly opinionated, be articulate, and try to hop onto like the, I guess, people that host political panels is probably the best way to do it. There's a bunch of smaller streamers that have like panels yeah. where they'll invite like eight to nine people on to like shout and scream at each other. That's probably the best okay. way for a new person to like enter the debating market i would say yeah okay well i appreciate that mm -hmm. hey um destiny i just want to thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to connect with you you're yeah. very generous by wait, the wait, way wait. and i will say before you yeah i'm curious hold on before you go because you said you give you give advice to a demographic that basically doesn't exist on the internet right like women over 40 outside of like facebook groups i don't see them very much on like youtube or in the streaming world um what do you for women in that age demographic what do you think is their biggest problem generally because you said that you try to coach them on how to be in relationships especially with divorced men what do you what is like your what are the unique challenges that you do with when you're talking to those types of people. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So um, actually, I do have 150,000 subscribers, so there is at least enough of a demographic that's actually you know logging in, and I get a fair amount of views uh, mm -hmm. per video. And I think with our age demographic, it's quite a bit different. I think with men over 40, particularly, the, I'd, I'd say roughly 75% of 
people in this age demographic are divorced. And that's anecdotal on my part. I don't uh -huh. have actually hard facts. Um, first off, I think a lot of men in particular after going through a divorce are gun shy. Gun shy of wanting to be in a long-term relationship with someone. It could be because of the financial uh, impact that might have had on them, or it just might be that they had such a terrible experience. Um, and, and again, I said earlier, most humans don't have really good uh, emotional maturity or relationship skills. So I think one of the problems women are faced with is their desire to have long-term partners and a lot of men are just not, they're, they're in it for the short run, unintentionally, by the way. I think they desire relationship, but they just don't know how to be in a good relationship with someone. So they enter into the dating process, expecting it to be easy. And if it's not easy, if they're not you know head over heels, they move on to the next one, the next one, because we have this thing called online dating or, or dating apps, where we have this like, you know, false sense of choice, you know? Um, and they figure they can just go find someone to replace them. So that's what a lot of women feel frustration is that the men are rather act, they appear commitment phobic or even lack good, you know, communication skills outside of that early stages of trying to convince someone to like you. You know, we kind of, Chris Rock says we show up as the ambassador of our best selves in the beginning of a relationship and we're all in interested. But the minute, it's interesting, the minute they have sex, all of a sudden guys go, oh, well, I'm not really that into her. I'm just gonna move on to the next person. So they ghost and disappear. Mm -hmm. Those are just some of the frustrations women feel in particular. Um, and I think men feel the same, you know, it's interesting for men uh, in the over 40 demographic, and you said this earlier, you know, it used to be height played really, I, I don't think most women in their 20s really cared about how tall a guy is, as an example. Mm -hmm. The minute they hit 40, every woman wants a man over six foot tall. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which, I, I swear to God, I mean, like, I mean, uh, and by the way, I've had women five foot two tell me I refuse to date someone under six foot two. Do you it, think that's a like, do you think that's a preference that they would actually adhere to, or do you think that's something they say? But if they met the right guy, they would be like, well, coming, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting. I think because on the online dating, it's right there in your face, and they're already excluding based on height. Mm -hmm. Versus if they met them out in the real world and got to know someone's personality, I think that probably dissipates substantially that yeah. height requirement. That's something that but I talk online. about a lot that I hate about the online stuff is I think that you yeah. can over filter and not realize um, like how much stuff you, you, you could you would even enjoy in real life. There are like I, I have like three or four like major qualifying things that like I'll be on shows and women will say things like, yeah, I would never date a guy. Or I would never even hook up with a guy who's like bi or who's like progressive or stuff like this. Yeah. But like given enough time that we can spend together, like these things absolutely don't matter. And I, and I know that like there's yeah. But like in their mind, they've got like a lot of preconceptions. I think the issue is people without realizing it in their mind, they've got preconceptions that are associated with these types of traits and they don't know that they're not necessarily tied together. So for instance, I think like when a woman says that she wants a guy that's six feet tall, what she's really saying yeah. is like, I just want a guy who's like a masculine dude who's confident and assured himself. And they probably associate shorter dudes with like lack of confidence, maybe being more effeminate or other things. But like if they met a guy that they genuinely got along with and vibe with and like thought he met, you know, like most of the qualifications, I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think that a woman is gonna be like, listen, like this is working out so well and you're so good for me in so many different ways, but like you're only 5'10 and I just can't see there being like a future with us, especially if she's like 5'4 or 5'3, you know? Yeah, uh, for the women that are five seven, five eight, five nine, you know, mm -hmm. it, it does become a little bit problematic because, to some degree, there is a, a desire to have your partner taller than you. And for every, sure. I will tell you, on dating profiles, every woman will write, you know, I'm, I'm five foot six and I wear five inch heels. So, yeah. you know, it's like you have to be taller than what I'm wearing on heels. Mm -hmm. But coming back to what you said earlier, you know, like come the idea that taller represents maybe a belief that you can be more of a protector and masculine. Look at a uh, Bruce Lee was five foot six at best and he yeah. could kick the shit out of 20 guys at once and the average navy seal you know who are probably the baddest hombres on the planet are five foot nine is the average navy seal because that's the average height of men mm -hmm. you know? so i mean those are some of the problems i see with women uh, discriminating against men the other thing that we see in my age demographic is age discrimination particularly um okay so most people over 50 years old 
fudge on their age on their dating profile. <laughs> sure. Okay, most everybody does. I did, you know, my partner did. I've definitely I mean, seen was, some women on Tinder that are like 32, and I'm like, honey, <laughs> no <laughs> shot. Yeah, exactly. You haven't seen and, the, the better end of 30s in like five years, okay? So, we're, come on. Like, you can fudge a couple years, but yeah, some people go a little wild when it comes to, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they all, and then they want to say, well, everybody tells me I'm looking 10 years younger. Well, like, who gives a shit what everybody else says? You know, what matters most is if what I think about you. But for women in particular, they, they discriminate on age because there's this, once a man starts hitting closer to 60, you know, he's less virile, you know, there's is closer to death. So I see things like I don't want to become his nurse or his purse kind oh, of sure. thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we see a lot of that. And, and men discriminate on age, too. You know, I mean, most male ego, like even myself included, you know, um, I wanted someone 10 or 15 years younger than me. That's what my ego wants. Do I do most men get what they want? No. But they they write off on the bat on their profiles aren't even swiping on in many cases, a lot of women their own age because they have this perception that they can actually get someone younger. And I see that happening where a lot of people aren't connecting for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just ultimately, you know, I, I think one of the problems is, and not that I'm trying to, I'm going to talk about sex for a second. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not a Puritan by any means. I think people can have sex on a first date and have healthy, happy relationships. But I think people are having sex today, at least in my age demographic, before any real trust is built between two people. I mean, you barely know someone and you're being physically intimate and women bond with men, you know, even in their 40s, 50s and 60s, you can bond with someone um, before you actually ever really know who they are. And I think that's one of the problems because there's this saying, women are the gatekeepers of sex and men are the gatekeepers of commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, the minute you have sex, you know, your bargaining chip in the past used to be, if you wanted to get laid, you had to get married. You know, that was the bargaining chip and it shouldn't have been, you know, I'm not saying that that was right or wrong. Yeah. But today, we're, I think people are being physically intimate well before they actually to know doing here, guys? who this person is. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, I, there's, I can and see- again, I'm not trying to be mm -hmm. Puritan here, you mm -hmm. know? I, the thing that I would generally say is that like, I think that, people uh, I think people treat sex a little bit too loosely sometimes like I think sexual revolution is cool I, the idea of having sex is yeah. awesome I like having sex I think it's fine but I worry sometimes that people are a little bit too lackadaisical about it uh, like willing to jump into um, sexual relationships without like making sure like the guy is safe uh, like the guy's not gonna do any creepy or weird shit or be too pushy yeah. or stuff like that um, and then also I think like an encouragement that I give to women in general is if you are looking for a serious relationship it's probably better to like wait a little bit to fuck because like um, if a guy is just trying to like you know fuck you and leave um, yeah. Then, yeah you know although Although I've, that could go both ways too. Maybe it's better to just fuck them immediately, yeah. and then if they leave, then it's like <laughs> at least I didn't waste my time. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, you yeah. know, it's interesting. So I told you I had a hundred, you know, meet and greets my first year out of my divorce, and you know, back then you'd, you'd spend a little like through the online dating. First, you'd text mess or you'd um, message each other a little bit, then you'd have a couple phone calls. You build a little bit of familiarity, mm -hmm. and if there's even just a little bit of sexual tension between two people before they physically meet. You know, what would happen is I'd go meet someone, there would be a few cocktails, we're both, you know, we, we both have our own homes, you know, we're not living with our parents like we did in our 20s. Mm -hmm. And I, I found myself literally, a third of the women probably had sex with me on the first date. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm a guy, you know, I'm driven by my penis. I mean, I, even if, though I think I'm more evolved now, but back then I certainly was. Mm -hmm. And what happened, uh, Destiny, was the minute I came, and the next day, this person that I really liked, I was totally into, I was experiencing all these great feelings. All of a sudden, I'm like, why don't I like this person anymore? Uh, and I don't mean that I dislike them. I'm like, why aren't I feeling I this type of feeling? Yeah. Yeah. And and I so I did a, I started the study that you know the the effects of limerence and the effects of lust. Mm -hmm. And I think most people early in dating they're experiencing lust or limerence, thinking that you have this real great soulmate kind of connection, mm -hmm. <laughs> only to find out like after you know the next day I'm like why don't I like this person? Because the brain chemicals that were being released and you know through our body that dopamine hit is gone, at least for the man. Now for a woman, 
they might be experiencing oxytocin during that physical bonding experience and find that they're actually attached to the guy where a guy can become detached. Sure. Yeah. Even for like casual sexual encounters I have now, like I'll, if I'm thinking of meeting somebody or having somebody over, I'll usually I'll masturbate on it. And then when I finish, I'll think like, OK, I finished Would I would I still want this person around. And then if the answer is no, I usually just stop talking to the person because I'm like, I shouldn't even have them over because I know that like it's not going to be a fun experience because I. Yeah. So, yeah, even on casual encounters, like because I like to be friends with people that I hook up with. I don't want to just like like in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Having like a one night stand where you like don't even want to talk to the person. See, the person is just like that's not very much fun. I don't think it's not very fulfilling. Yeah. Even on like a casual casual sex level, but um, yeah. No, and I found that, by the way, going through this experience, and again, with the internet, it was like the Wild West 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a whole different ball game. Um, it, it, it created this false sense of, a kind of false sense of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And what I found was I really desired, really connect with, with someone who was, like you said, a friend, if you will, uh, because it made the experience more enjoyable than just getting off. And I know for myself, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with, I'm a, you know, I have one partner and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more enriching because we have a deep connection. But today, and I don't know if you know who Esther Perel is, um, but she did a video some months back about artificial intimacy. You know, through the internet, you know, people are experiencing artificial intimacy, believing that it's real intimacy. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Especially for the so internet I, as we continue to substitute like real life connections and everything for just like online stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I just want your take on something that I've said before. You know, I don't think humans were designed to talk with their thumbs, but now today, you know, text messaging is almost the preferred communication. And I think it's something like 80 or 90% of communication is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. So here people have built this entire you know, world of, uh, you know, with another human being literally just based on text messaging and not real interaction. And I see this as a huge problem that's just getting even worse. Yeah, I think this is actually a fundamental problem that's underlying a lot of societal ills right now that people don't talk about enough. They're very keen to blame feminism or lower testosterone or, uh, I don't know, the deep state or whatever. But in reality, I think the um, existence of social media has fundamentally altered a lot of the ways that we communicate with people, I, I think, for the worse in some ways. Um, like I always bring up, like when I was in school, social media existed to make your real life interactions better. Right. Like when Facebook came out, the primary purpose was to um, was to see like parties and gatherings. There were like four functions mm -hmm. on Facebook. It was like friends, messaging. I think you had your wall and then it was um, checking into yeah. events. And that's that. That's what everybody used Facebook for. Facebook was used to check into parties and stuff. And um, yeah, but now it's like social media has kind of become like a replacement for a lot of real life interaction, which is probably not good. Uh, well, isn't it? And by the way, please forgive me, but you, you know, you're a gamer, and I suspect a lot of young men, you know, get into gaming, and they're not actually. I, I I suspect, and I don't know you well enough to know, you actually interact with people outside of the dozen hours you spend streaming. Mm -hmm. um, you're actually interacting with people. I think a lot of young men are so you know tied into their the the tube, if you will, that they're not actually physically interacting with people. Yeah, I mean, I agree. That's why I've always said, like, I'm really lucky that I have, like, a foot in both worlds because when I grew up, the Internet wasn't really a thing, um, even though I yeah. played games a lot. Like, I was still a very social, real-life social person. And um, the idea of today growing up and basically having the entirety of your social uh, life being online is not good. Yeah. No. Um, and, and, again, I don't know if it's going to get... I, I see a lot of... My son always said, like, I grew up without the Internet, right? And he says, oh, there's all these great benefits of the Internet. You can research information. You can connect with people. But, you know, back when I grew up, we, like, we went out and played in the playground, you know? Mm -hmm. We actually interacted with people because... And, by the way, for meeting girls, if you will, because, I mean, I remember, you know, in my 20s, you know, what I did Friday and Saturday night, it was we go out to, you know, we go out to places where you could dance and meet people. I think, especially with COVID now, people, I, I wonder if it's just, if it's, if this is going to be, I don't want to say the downfall, because that does, that sounds so dramatic, but the, the real challenge for human pair bonding is, are you spending enough time in the real world versus through your thumbs, if you will? Yeah, I think we'll figure it out. I think, 
society has gotten like very flexible today. We can adapt to difficulties like really well. I think eventually it'll get bad enough to where people will realize like, okay, something needs to change significantly. And then we'll start making technologies and progress economically in that direction. And then the social behavior will follow, I think, but maybe I'm an optimist, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna share your optimism as well. So um, any other questions you have for me? Um, no, I think that's probably it, yeah. Okay. What did your, what was well, the, I'm so curious, what was the first video your son showed you of me? <laughs> oh, oh God, it was probably, I mean, shoot, it could have been a Jordan Peterson video, it could have been, it was, I'm sure it was politically mm -hmm. motivated, or what is a woman, or whatever, all that stuff, you know, and, and by the way, I, I, I'll share with you, um, you're, you're an incredibly intelligent man, I mean, you have the capacity to, you know, uh, do five things at once, which shocks me at times. Um, I will tell you, I watched you. Can I share something with you? Uh, just my perception of you? Whatever you want. Yeah, go for it. Um, it was, I think there were two women you were debating. Um, it had to do with abortions and oh, God. the right to life and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I, I sometimes wonder if you, this is, you know, if you just get a real kick out of just fucking with people. Um, I mean, it depends saying, on... By the way, please forgive that uh, the way I framed it, but I think you get the gist of where I was going. Yeah, I understand. It, I mean, it depends on the concept, of, or uh, not the concept, it depends on the context of the conversation. That conversation yeah. that I just recently had, I realized, like, about, like, 20 minutes in that, like, this is fucked, so it's just figuring out how to manage, like, the meta conversation, because, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Now that you just said that to me, that makes sense. Because in the beginning, I felt that you were engaged, but then I, I could literally see you just go, ah, eh, you know what? I'm just going to just, how can I, again, and I say the term fuck with them, but just mm -hmm. play with it. Um, because I, I, you know, they were so rigid on their side and there wasn't really, I, I felt like there wasn't really giving an opportunity for you to accept that what you said to you what you said to them, excuse me, is true for you. It doesn't mean it's the truth. It's just it felt true for you. But for them, their truth was the absolute truth. And I, I suspect that's got to be really frustrating for you because, you know, the whole idea of debating is giving an argument that maybe sways someone to go, oh, maybe there is some validity to that. Mm -hmm. But when you butt up against those people, I think sometimes you, or at least what I've observed is you throw up your arms. Or, nah, that's not true. Yeah, I mean, like, that. there's, like, once you realize that, like, the rational, reasonable argument is done, then you just kind of shift into another mode, because you're not going to sit there and try to pound, you know, somebody with logic or, like, oh, let's debate this, blah, 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 when they're just, like, trying to get, you know, TikTok clips or personal attacks, whatever. It's like, okay, well, I'm not going to play this game if you're not playing this game, so we'll switch, you know, <laughs> we'll switch games, I guess, yeah. Well, do you, let me ask you this, though, because I'm curious, and I don't think I've, I've witnessed, I mean, I've watched a ton of your content, just so you know. Um, I haven't really seen you have a really good debate with someone where there was a really good exchange of ideas where you actually were listening to the other person. You know, um, I, I watched um, J Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris um, have a conversation some years ago. It was like a four-day event. And, mm -hmm. and I really appreciated that these two people really listen to the other person's point of view um, and 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 really try to articulate from their perspective. And I don't feel like you get that chance. I would um, say probably the best recent in the past year debate I've had. Are, are you familiar with a guy yeah. called Matt Dillahunty? No, I'm not. Um, I super disagree with his justification for abortion. He argues bodily autonomy. Okay. And we have a, I, what I would consider to be a really good conversation um, at a live debate panel. But... Um, those don't pick up as many views because people like to people like to shout against me. But that was a, I think that was a really high quality conversation. Yeah, I know, but it's got to get frustrating for you at times because I know you can go toe to toe with the sneakos of the world or the fresh and fits and the pearl just pearly things. But you just gotta. I, I'm assuming here, just watching you, you're just like, oh my god, this is just exhausting doing the same thing over and over again. I I, I feel like you desire really good conversations with people. Uh, where you can debate your ideas and you're actually, you know, they, both parties are actually listening to the other side. Yeah, I kind of, when I got into things, I kind of figured it would be like 50-50, like crazy convos and good convos, but it's more like 98-2, um, which gets <laughs> annoying. But yeah, I mean, like the reality is, is most people don't reason themselves into positions. Most people get there through a variety of other means. So that's basically what yeah. you have to meet people at, you know, but yeah, I mean, that's just yeah, the reality of well, when I got my channel started, there was this guy, Kevin Samuels, that was Oh, on. God. 
And, and so, and, and I was watching, you know, I'm, I was observing it from the perspective of, well, how's he growing his channel? Well, the more controversial you are, uh, and the more you're in people's face, the, you know, the, the more views you'd get. And to some degree, I, I try to incorporate kind of a rationale of both on my channel. And look at, I'm small compared to some, but 150,000 ain't too, you mm -hmm. know, isn't something to sneeze at. And it generates a, you know, a fair amount of ad revenue from mm -hmm. it too. Um, but I'm, I'm looking for better conversations. So when I do, when my son says, uh, hey, watch this one with Destiny, <laughs> I'm like, okay, because I know he's vetted. He knows me well enough to know that I like what you have to say, mm -hmm. but I like it when you're really getting a chance to speak. And when I watch those, you know, the fresh and fit and, and just burly things, I mean, they were so kind of, not that anyone could bully you, uh, but they were trying to. Anyway. Yeah, and, yeah. It just turns uh, into like ad homs and personal attacks and silly, yeah, fights like that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. I will tell you though, the Jesse Peterson one was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah uh, that was that was, <laughs> it was an experience. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, my son and I go back and forth. Are you a beta male kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, I think half my fans do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think of you that. By the way, did you say you're a Sigma male? <laughs> like jokingly, There's, but yeah. But I know, but I actually went to look, go look that up. I was curious, uh, but I, I think you happen to have a really good. Um, I think you have a good understanding of your. For, and I don't like the terms masculine and feminine. I like to look at people from a personhood perspective. But I think you have a really good balance of if if we were going to characterize people that way, that you have a really good balance in that sense. And it's one of the reasons why I like watching you because you're not rigid i mean sometimes you could be rigid but <laughs> yeah uh, but for the most part you really do try to see two sides of an argument and that's one of the reasons why i enjoy watching you well thanks yeah i try my best i try to yeah. encourage others to do the same so yeah yeah so right, well, um where um for people that are like looking for your stuff where should they where do you want to direct them uh well i'm just going to send you in the chat box uh <laughs> my YouTube channel. If you could send people to my YouTube channel, I'd appreciate that. I mean, even though my demographic is a bit older than yours, I, I do think, um, and by the way, it's Jonathan Asley, J-O-N-A-T-H-O-N-A-S-L-A-Y. Um, I'd like to think that, you know, younger people can get a lot of value from speaking to people who have been around the block mm -hmm. a bit more than this, you know, like what you talked about with those guys. I mean, how many of these guys have had a relationship that lasted, you know, a year, let alone a week? Um, you know, so I'd like to think that my content uh, really helps, um, you know, younger people as well as people in my age demographic. Sure. Yeah. Uh, did you get the link in the chat box? Um, let me look for it. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I agree. Especially. Well, I think I'd like to agree. Yeah. Some people will. If you see like a bunch of older people complaining about the same thing, maybe you can see like, oh, maybe that's something I can avoid in the future. Although I'm pretty stubborn and I have to learn through <laughs> experience. So. But yeah. Oh, you want to hear something funny? If you got a few extra minutes. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, I went through a divorce court um, and we actually had to go to family court. Mm -hmm. um, and when you go to family court, there's usually like four or five couples on the, the morning docket and four and five couples in the afternoon docket. So, and you all have to be there at eight o'clock. Yeah. And, um, and so, but you might not go up in front of the judge until like 11 a.m. or even noon. Well, but yeah, somewhere between, you know, 11, 1130 would be the last couple. Mm -hmm. So I, we happen to be the third out of the fourth. And I'm listening to the other couples talk to the judge, right? Mm -hmm. And sharing their perspective. And I actually stayed for the couple after um, my, my ex-wife and I were in front of the judge. And I thought, if you really want to learn a lot about relationship, spend a day in a family court. Yeah. Because you can really, because honestly, you can actually see where the pitfalls lie within humans. If you actually kind of see where they kind of connect the dots uh, to some degree. And again, they're giving their own narratives in both cases, but I thought it was fascinating. And I think it'd be behoove people to actually go to family court for a day or two, mm -hmm. just to listen to what causes most endings of a relationship and not pick a side, but just be there as an observer. Um, uh, it's just something I thought that you might get a kick out of here. And yeah, I um, mean that definitely um, that that definitely wouldn't surprise me. You, I've been to court a couple times, and you can <laughs> you definitely see a lot of stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily. So yeah. No, and outside of the the TV reality TV shows of divorce court, um, one of the things I uh, there's a person I follow, the Gottmans. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, John Gott, John and Julie Gottman. 
Um, oh yeah, of they, course, yeah, big relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and and what's interesting, they have a book, um, how to make a successful seven principles for successful marriage, eight mm-hmm. dates, which are eight critical conversations to have in the early stages of the dating, um, because they've observed where relationship goes wrong. I think it behooves people or would, would behoove them to maybe find out what is the cause of most ending relationships and kind of be prepared for it before you ever get there. I think, I think one of the naive things happens, you asked me about my age demographic, is a lot of people got married in their 20s, got divorced in their 40s and 50s, and they have no clue about how to date, you know, 20 years in the future from when they started. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, how to build a relationship with someone because they had, for lack of a better word, um, not a failed marriage, but a marriage that was probably not built on a very strong foundation to begin with. So I think it would behoove, you know, especially millennials and, and Gen Zs or whatnot to really study if they really want the healthy relationship, even the incels out there in the world, maybe instead of watching the Andrew Tate of the world, maybe read some Gottman work so they actually know how to be in a relationship and then get Jordan Peterson's book, to, to, you know, and only to the extent that the 12 rules of life are pretty good things to have in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and then go out and try to be in a relationship. I think it would be really interesting. I really want to see like Dr. Gottman on like Fresh and Fit. I think that would be a really funny show. I don't know what it would end up looking like, but yeah. No, I know, but you know what? Those guys will bully the Gottmans, and they, yeah, I would yeah. love to see. There is a psychologist, uh, Sasha something or other. Um, she's um, grew up in England. She's from the Middle East. Um, she's trying to have these conversations, and she's been on these shows, but she also kind of parrots a little bit of their narrative, um, which. But I would love to see on these shows, you know, a whole different age demographic of guests mm-hmm. that actually have their shit together. Yeah, people that, that are actually, actually in life. successful relationships too. Like no more people that have like hooked up with 50 girls and don't have a yeah. significant other or have been dating for two months. Like show me people that have been dating for years and years that like know how to, yeah. It would be so much more interesting and healthy, I think, for a lot of these people, yeah. So yeah, but really quickly, you know, when I heard Pearl say, you know, all these, you know, only fan girls, I actually was curious how many only fans creators are out there. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's only, I think it's 2 million um, actual creators. Uh-huh. Okay. So of the 8 billion on the, and that's worldwide, right? Mm-hmm. So oh, okay. actual only, and I, I could be mistaken, at least that's what the internet said. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's such a still small percentage of women who are actually have an OnlyFans account, you know, but they say the downfall of relationships are all the women are on OnlyFans. I'm like, really? Like 90, 98 women out of 100 don't have an OnlyFans account. Sure. And it's probably um, the majority of those are probably they've posted one or two pictures and then like never posted again, right? Like the vast majority of women yeah, exactly. are like super successful. Yeah. Although my son will kill me for this, but his ex-girlfriend actually has one account. Okay, and Jesus, she makes, no, you don't have to out so, your son like that. Oh, no. No, he's going to kill me. But she <laughs> actually makes, let's put it to you this way. Her taxes was a seven million, or excuse me, seven-figure check for the government. I mean, she really Okay, she, chill, geez, geez, hold on. There's not that many <laughs> girls that fit the bill on that, okay? <laughs> I know. Well, no, no, no. I don't, I know. It's just anime stuff. I don't think it's even sexual. <laughs> okay. Um but I know he's going to kill me because he's listening to this right now. Yeah, but my he will kill bringing you. This up. Uh, <laughs> well, he, thankfully, he loves me enough to give me some grace, I hope. Um, okay. But I, I do believe that's such a small percentage of women who are actually making that kind of living. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you know, more power to them to some degree. You know, it's a, it, it maybe in this limited period of time, you can build some net worth from that. So more power to them. Um, anyway, that's just a perception I have, and I know he's going to kill me. Um, but like I said, thankfully we have that kind of relationship where we can talk about, sh- we can give shit to one another. Yeah. All right. Well. Mm. Um, oh, so yeah. hopefully. <laughs> well, listen. I, I, you know, I, I, I was so grateful you gave me this time, or at least um, had an opportunity to talk to you. I, and I appreciate you know sharing my content with people as well. That I'd really appreciate. And I'll just keep watching you. And if there's another chance to speak, I'd love that opportunity as well. Yeah. If anything ever pops up that you super disagree with, or that I talk to somebody you feel like I missed something, like yeah, shoot me a message and we can yeah chat. Okay, I'll do that. Cool. All right. Well, hey, listen, I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks. I appreciate it as well, Destiny. Yeah. Have a good one. I'll talk okay. to you. Later. Bye. You too. Thanks. Bye now.